Hi, my friends, it's Brendan, and I come to you with some sad news that Larry King, the famous interviewer, broadcaster, newsman, TV personality, and a mentor to me, has passed away uh, on January 23rd, 2021. And in this unreleased video, he and I discussed what he would want uh, on, in his obituary, on his tombstone, at the end of his life. We talked about what he was proud of. We talked about his you know, famous style of curiosity. We talked about what he thought of success and what made people successful. And it was just a wide-ranging conversation that we've um, decided to post here. We thought with his passing, this would be a time because you know he was very reflective about the end of his life. And I think um, it really speaks well to him and I hope that you will enjoy the video. Um, my condolences go out to his family, his friends, to everybody in the industry who've been impacted in such positive ways throughout his life. You know, 60 years in broadcasting, over 50,000 interviews, to say he was a legend and an icon and a pioneer is, is an understatement. Um, for me personally, uh, when I was a 19-year-old kid, I was in depression. I and one of the reasons was is because I didn't know how to communicate. I didn't know how to share my emotions. I didn't know how to talk to people. I was awkward. And I picked up Larry King's book, How to Talk to Anyone, Anytime, Anywhere. And it taught me about the power of asking questions and being present and holding space and, and just how to engage with people, which was important for a kid like me who was awkward and a poor communicator. So very early on, he changed my life. And, and you know, decades later, getting to work with him on interview series. We filmed a course with him. Uh, he interviewed me multiple times. I interviewed him multiple times, uh, including in his home and in his awards room. We, we, we were, I was so happy to have those experiences with my mentor, you know. Life is short. I'll always find your mentors and say thank you in some way, give back to them in some way. And I had the blessing to do that with Larry because uh, his son-in-law, Danny Southwick, introduced us and. Uh, coordinated so many things. Sean King was so supportive of getting us together and getting us on camera and creating a series together. And again, we never released it. And this video is from that. And I just thought you would enjoy it to hear him reflecting on the end of his life. And his family supported and encouraged us to release the video for you. And um, I just want to share that. Um, I think the secret to a great and long life Larry shares, which is curiosity. Please enjoy the video. Have you ever had a moment in your life that just changed everything, changed the course of your life? And what was it? Well, I didn't know it at the time, mm. but it was my father's death. Mm. I was nine and a half years old. He was 46. We were very close. I have a younger brother. He had lost a son who was six years old before I was born. Mm. So I had a brother I never met. And uh, it was a very tragic day to me. He died of a heart attack sudden. And uh, I was a very studious student. I, was, I skipped third grade. I was a good kid. And I was coming home on a Saturday morning from the library. I took out six books. I was an avarice reader. And uh, there were cops coming down the stairs in our apartment building. He was a pretty popular guy, my father. And the cops knew him. Mm -hmm. And this cop picked me up. Books fell everywhere. And he took me in a squad car. And he told me my father died. Mm -hmm. And he took me to a movie to get oh. away from the day I went to see Back to Bataan. Before you saw your mom, he took you to the yeah, movie? Just yeah, took with you. Robert Taylor. Wow. Yeah, he, well, he was that family there all day. Mm. And uh, I took it very badly, and I got angry. Uh, I didn't understand that. I got angry at him for leaving me. I didn't go to the funeral. Mm. I took it very badly. There's a great play by James Agee called Dark at the Top of the Stairs. Another title of it is A Death in the Family in which a nine-year-old boy is uh, faced with the death of his father and the family telling him he is now, he's now the head of the house. Mm. And I couldn't handle that, you know, you're the, now the head of the house. So I became... Did someone actually say that to you as well? Oh, yeah. yeah. You, it's, now you're, you're the man. And I was bar mitzvahed, and, uh, but I, I wasn't a very good student the rest of the way. I fudged things a lot, I cut classes, I just did get out of high school, never went to college. So that left a lasting impression on me. But the one resolve I had was that I loved radio. And when I was a kid, I was five years old, I used to listen to the radio, listen to Dodger games and radio programs. I was fascinated with it. I used to imitate them. Hmm. I'd hear programs and imitate the announcers. 
When I was 12, 13 years old, I'd go into the city. We lived in Brooklyn. We called Manhattan the city. And I'd go around to radio shows just to watch people perform on the radio. Speaking As how old? 12, 14. Uh, how'd you wander in there? Did they say, hey, took kid, a get out of here? Took a, oh, no, yeah. Yeah, I'd tell them, <laughs> I would, can I see? Huh. Some shows had studio audiences, quiz shows. Mm. And uh, I was fascinated with it. I didn't know how, quite what to do, but I had a bunch of odd jobs. 19, 20, 21, my brother went to law school. Helping my mother, I worked, I worked to help my mother. We were on relief for two years. New York City bought my first pair of eyeglasses, all of which I blamed on my father. Hmm. Um, relief was a hard thing to take. You know, for two years they told us what we could eat and uh, paid our rent. It was New York City, a very generous city. In New hmm. York. Uh, that's why the older I got, the more liberal I got. I, I, mean, I, I understood welfare, and I understood relief, and I understood poverty. This is the city helping take care of your family after your dad passed. Correct. Yeah. That's what a, a city is a big family, and that's what a family is supposed to do. Yeah. But uh, then I got a break and uh, met a guy in the street who told me to try Miami, and I broke into radio. But the most uh, revolutionary event, if I would look back, mm -hmm. would be that death. I would go to ball games and come back and describe the whole game to my friends, mm -hmm. tell them about movies. I like describing things. You're like a natural communicator already. Natural. And yeah. I was also always curious. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the big, Anthony Quinn told me that, that you have the luxury of curiosity. And that has never left me. Do you think that's your number one strength? To, absolutely, to this day. Hmm. It's my, it lends to my sense of humor. It lends to things about me. I, I never have all the answers. I hate people who have all the answers. I don't hate them, but I, people who think you they know. You can see it. People who think they know yeah. everything yeah. don't. Hmm. So I never had a guest where I thought I knew more, the, more about law than the lawyer, more about government than the governor, more about show business than the singing star. Mm. So therefore I was curious. But I could remember, I, I swear, to, I could remember being nine years old, getting on a bus and asking the bus driver, why do you want to drive a bus? How do you get out of driving a bus? Mm. So I never lost that. And anybody who'd ever watch all my shows to this day, you rarely have ever heard the word I. I don't use it, it's irrelevant. Mm. In an interview, what I think is... And this is hard for you, right, then? What I think is, no, now I'm being asked quite, so yeah. I know what you want. <laughs> That's right. I'm responding to you. Right. But if I were doing my own show, mm. I, there's no reason to say the word I. Uh. What I think is irrelevant. What the guest thinks threw me to the... I'm a conduit mm. to the audience. So I, I'm a storyteller. I love to talk. Mm. I do a comedy act. I love making people laugh. But when it comes to a guest, the guest counts. And I've, all, I've just always been insanely curious. I'm the kind of person you really do not want to sit next to on an airplane. <laughs> I was doing a radio show at Pumpernick's Restaurant in Miami, Miami Beach. And uh, before Bobby Darren came in one day, he was the first famous person I ever interviewed. Uh, I would interview uh, salesmen, waitresses. You know, it was, it was a coffee pot show. I'd do my own disc jockey show in the morning and then run up and do this hour interview show. And one day there was a, a plumber in the audience, a plumber. And I called him up and I did 35 minutes asking questions of a plumber. Now, I was 22 years old, 22 and a half. I still remember things I learned at that interview. That plumber is just as happy at the end of a day when he fixes the faucet or stops the leak as I am when I interview someone and get something out of them. It's that same degree. I love what I do. What do you feel like if someone writes in, though, if a fan writes in and says, well, Larry, sure, you, you can be on the fly. This is comfortable for you, but I have, you know, I have all this self-doubt or I have this fear. If you have the fear, go to the fear. In other words, you're nervous. You get up in front of an audience. I'm nervous. You know? I, you mean is, say it. Say tell it. people. Got sure. It. Mm. I did it my first day on the air. This is a memory that lasts with me forever. All my life, I want to get in the radio. I go down to Miami, I knock on doors, a station says, hang around here, we get one opening, you're hired. Hmm. They get an opening. Hmm. I'm gonna start Monday morning, disc jockey. It's Friday night, I'm told I'm gonna start Monday morning. I stay up all week, I do not sleep. I'm nervous, I'm practicing, hello, good morning, good morning, good morning, what am I gonna say? And I pick out my music. I go on the air at nine, I get to the station at 5 a.m. I'm all prepared. I go in to meet the general manager, 
It's a quarter to nine. I go on at nine. He says, Larry, good luck. It's the start of your career. What name are you going to use? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you can't use Zyger. Larry Zyger. Now you could use it. Don't matter now. He said, well, it's too ethnic and people don't know how to spell it. You need another name. What am I going to do? And he, I'm going on the end, 15 minutes. And he had the Miami Herald open. I would later write a column for the Miami Herald. Mm. The Miami Herald opened, and it's, there was an ad for King's Wholesale Liquors on Washington Avenue. And he said, how about Larry King? He chose it. Yeah. Mm. I said, well, it sounds okay. I later legally changed it. Mm. Oh, no, I sit down to go in here. I got my record cute Les Elgard swinging down the lane. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Start the music. Up goes the music. Now I got to fade the music and talk, right? Da-da-da-da-da-da-da. I fade the music. Nothing comes out. I bring the music back up. Nerves? Nerves. Stop I fade the music. I'm looking at the clock. It's now two minutes after nine. Or if you're listening at home, all you hear is music going down and up, <laughs> down and up. And the general manager... Kicked open the door, Marshall Simmons, never forget him. Kicked open the door to the studio. And he said, this is a communications business, damn it, communicate. And he slammed the door. I turned on the mic, turned down the record and said, good morning. My name is Larry King. That's the first time I've ever said that. Because I've just been given that name. Because I'm starting my career in radio today and my name it was too ethnic, so they gave me this name, Larry King. And I, you've been listening to record go up and down, because I am so nervous, I tell you. Wow. All my life I wanted to do this, and this is my moment. My hands are shaking, and I'm scared, and I wonder if I can do this. Mm. So I'm going to do the best I can. I was never nervous again any day of my life. Gave you confidence going on the acknowledging air. it just by being honest. Yep. As you get that successful worldwide known, more stress, more opportunities, do you have any practices you do in your I, life to keep you stress-free? Do you, do you, do you have no, I, I don't. Stress, I think, was a good thing to me. In what uh, way? Henry King Stanford, the former president of the University of Miami, said that some people strive on stress. I liked stress. If it was stressful, if I was put in a position of having to broadcast an event that I'd never broadcast before, which would be stressful, mm. I liked that. You thrived on the challenge? Is that what yeah. it was? I liked it because I liked the fact that it's in my hands now. Mm. You know, and I, I'd, I had a scene once where, uh, when I was at CNN, a building in Manhattan blew up. It blew up. Someone had started, placed a bomb in the building. Mm -hmm. and it was right around the corner from my hotel. So I ran down the street, and I'm in the middle of the block, and the firemen knew me, and they let me through. So they got the hoses going and, the, you know, and all the people are being kept on the corner. So I did what I had to do. I called CNN and I went on the air. Mm. And they kept going back to me and I'm describing this building burning. I've never had to describe a building burning before or mm. firemen shooting. Well, so I, I never done that, but I never thought about it. Right, and there's no camera with you. It's just no camera. on the They're phone. They're taking my voice. Mm. Later, you could say that was stressful. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you ask me, boy, have you ever described a live building mm -hmm. on fire by exploding? No. Mm -hmm. But did I think about it? No. Right. You were just in the moment. But Trusted how, my instincts. I mean, you must have dealt with a lot of entertainers or other people who, who appeared on your show. They were terrified of their performance. They were worried. What do you say to them to calm them down and deal I with that? You try to do the best. I try to ease them. I try how to do you do it? I do it a lot with eyes, voice, eye contact. I care about you. Some of the most difficult people I've had the best time. I got Sinatra was hard to get, mm. and he didn't like doing interviews. And so I would ask him, why don't you like doing interviews? Mm. And work with them on that. In other words, by feeling them out, it's, some of this is inborn, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But some of it you can use in your daily life. Mm -hmm. Trust your instincts. Instincts are pretty good, you know? Mm. You, if you don't like someone... Follow that. Follow that. You're pretty good. You may be wrong, but you're better off trusting the instinct than not. And I've always trusted my broadcast instincts. And that's not the same as life instincts. Mm. You can make. I made a lot more mistakes in life than I ever made on the air. What was like, some of the big mistakes? Where you learned something? I married and wrong just, people. Uh, I uh, made bad decisions. I didn't handle money well. 
a lot of that was a carryover from my childhood of being the poorest kid on the block. You know, my, all my friends were, had more money than me. And so how was it a carryover into it? Like I guess because or? I wanted more, so, so I had to drive a bigger car, uh, so I bought a car I couldn't afford, and then I had to make payments. Mm. What makes a successful person? The search is how do we define success? Right. In other words, uh, success to him may be how much money he has. Success to him how much fame he has. Success to him is uh, the, how is his children doing. So there are degrees you can, we can define it differently. Do you think most people feel like success in their life? Do you think most people are most, wandering around saying, I would I'm, say I'm most okay? people don't think they're successful. Mm -hmm. Most people think the grass is greener. Mm -hmm. The grass isn't greener. That's a good advice I give to you. The grass is not greener. Mm -hmm. Your own grass is better than the grass over there. To appreciate what you have. Appreciate what you have. And uh, you used the word before, challenge. Jackie Gleason told me once, he didn't like challenges. He liked doing what he liked to do. <laughs> he didn't need to be challenged. Uh, I feel that success is overcoming adversity by always looking ahead. You know, the, the sun will come up tomorrow. Mm. And I, the driving part of me is, it's not the driving for finances or the driving for acclaim. It's the driving to be there to be in the hunt, mm -hmm. to participate, to have value, to know that you matter. It can matter that it, the mattering is just that you're filling, if your children love and you respect you and you're a, you're a motorman on the subway. But when you come home at night, your children adore you. Mm. And when you go to open school week and the teachers say, your kids are terrific, that's success. So it starts with them defining success. So you define your own. What gets in their way the most often? What do you think gets in people's oh, way? Turbulence. Unexpected things. The traffic accident. Mm. The sudden death of a father. Mm -hmm. The sickness. Life, John Kennedy said it best, life isn't fair. Life's not fair. Mm. Not fair. Why did that child die and why did he <clears throat> live? Hitler lived to 67. Someone died at 12. It ain't fair. Hmm. So turbulence hits you in life, and you have to do the best to overcome them. How have you done it? I've, I've met so many people in my life who talk about, I'm going to do this, but they don't do it. Hmm. I'm going to write. I'm going to, boy, I'm going to put this deal together. I'm going to be successful. Woody Allen said it best. Get off the porch. Get in the game. Do something. It's so easy. To sit on the porch and say, hey, boy, tomorrow I'm going to get off the porch. Get in the game. I always got off the porch. Nat King Cole said once, there are two kinds of people in the world. 98% watch the fox hunt. They watch the people go chasing the fox. They sit on the porch. They applaud the winner. They boo the loser. 2% chase the fox. Mm -hmm. I always chase the fox. Do you feel like you've changed in the last 60 yeah, of course. years? How, how so? Well, hopefully I've matured. There's still a little kid in me. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's important. Don't let the kid in you leave. If I had to give advice to someone, don't give up that little childhood thing. Yogi Berra once said, I play a little boy's game, and that little boy is always in me. Mm -hmm. So it's OK. Like the okay. child, the wonderment and, and oh, the yeah, joy but, and the innocence of yeah, the enjoy, moment. enjoy the enjoy the you know whatever profession you have, give to it, be try to be. You, I'm naturally competitive, I guess, but be the best at what you do. Mm. Just try to do the you know. And a rabbi told me when I asked a rabbi. Rabbi, do you believe in heaven? He said, well, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. But I tell you what, lead a good life. Mm. Take a chance. What's going to be part of your leading a good life the next, this next chapter, yeah. this next years well, of your life? What are you really focused on? I don't on? know what to think about at 81. Yeah. I think about health. I think about taking care of myself. I try to keep a better pace. I try not to think depressing thoughts. I think a lot about, 
I shouldn't be doing this a lot. I think a lot about dying, and I shouldn't do that. So if I'm giving advice, what do you advice, think about when you think about it? When you think say, about not being here. Yeah. The thought of not existing for eternity. Right. <laughs> Is that heavy? Heavy. heavy. Yeah. <laughs> In other words, I think Mario Cuomo just passed away, a great friend of mine. I think about him every day. And, and Mario is not seeing what happened last week in ISIS, and he's not seeing the storm today in New York, and he's not seeing any of that. Mm. He's not existing. Mm. And when I'm not here, will I, will, how will I be here? I, my children might think of me and stuff, but, but to not exist. For example, I'm not a fan of sleep. I know I have to sleep. I know I fall asleep. But if you could give me a wish, high up on the list would be don't sleep. A little, more, a little bit more each to day. To not have to sleep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Supposing you didn't have to sleep. Mm. You'd be awfully tired. No, but no, <laughs> no. That would probably, you don't get tired. Right. You know, you don't get tired <laughs> and you don't need to lie down. That would be my wife's suicide, not to get tired. <laughs> but me, if I didn't get tired, life would be a joy because this Somewhere in the world, people are up, right? right. So something's happening, something's happening. here when they're, they're, in Europe something's happening. Do you always feel like you're missing out on yeah. something? Yeah, you do. Miss out. Is that what yeah. keeps you up? A lot of times I think about things. I think about worldly things. I think about other things. I, I don't know what that is. I. Uh, well, it's the curiosity you were talking about. I guess earlier. it's 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 the curiosity of. I panic when I get a little illness. I try. This is not good advice for people. Huh? Mm. Well, this is a good, but this is a good place for you're, you're you're talking about, you know, thinking about death and thinking about life. So if you have this moment where you get to think about your life and it stood for something, it stood for a message. Well, I think what would you I, want I, that I think be? I. I think I entertain people. I think I edu helped educate people through gift of asking good questions. I hoped I made that the, my little small piece of this endless universe added something to the knowledge of people. It would be nice to be missed, you know. I don't want to be a whatever happened to, but it saddens me when I'll mention names like Arthur Godfrey, mm. and people don't know who I'm talking mm. about. And this was a man who accounted for 38 percent of CBS's income, mm. radio and television, every day. Legend. And no one knows him. Mm. People don't know him. Mm. And that, you want to be known. Well, you're known, and I guess my tombstone. What I make my tombstone would be is, "I'll be right back." <laughs> <laughs> what What are you most proud of? I'm proud of a lot of things. I'm proud of my family. I'm very proud of my family. I'm proud of my kids, all of them. Some are more successful than others, but all of them are good kids. That's a good kid. You want a good kid. I'm proud of, of uh, uh, my wife. I think, you know, I, I criticize her some when I kid her, but she's a hell of a lady. She's incredible. She, she is incredible. She's not the easiest person to live with, but that, why do you want someone easy to live with, you know? If you're on your I'm own. very proud of my accomplishments, too. I'm proud that in my industry, I'm in halls of fame. I got a lifetime achievement from the Emmys. You know, Had a career the, success. When your peers acknowledge you, that's a great, great thing. And I've had that, that great thing happen to me, that the peers acknowledge me. And that people still on the street recognize me or say, hello, Larry, or... One of the biggest little compliments I got, I don't even know if I ever told my wife this. I flew to Tampa to interview John McCain when he was running for president at the University of Tampa. We flew down there, we were going to do an hour at the university. Now, I flew in, he flew in, we both came in on private planes, came in about the same time. We pull up at the university and we're walking through the student lounge to go to where we're interviewed. And all the kids are going, hey, Larry, hey, Larry, hey, Larry, how are you, how are you, Larry? And John McCain said to me, why didn't you run? <laughs> <laughs> that was a proud moment. That's a proud moment. If you're, uh, you're, you're on your last show, your last interview, what would your sign-off be? I'd like to say I'll be right back. I'll tell you what I'd like my obit to be. Oldest man who ever lived passed away today, smiling in bed. 
Beautiful. Oldest man who ever lived. 